Good afternoon and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. My name is Zena Azam. I'm the executive director here and I'm delighted to have all of you with us. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are joining us online. Today we're focusing on a very important situation in the Arab region, which is the Yarmouk refugee camp in Syria. Since the early 1950s, this camp has been home to thousands of Palestinian refugees who fled Palestine during the Nakba in 1948. Before the Syrian civil war started, the population of Yarmouk camp is said to have reached about 160,000 Palestinians and Syrians. It was described as a thriving working class residential district of the capital, Damascus. Today that number is down to 18,000 people. They're stuck and they're terrified and besieged with no or little water, food, or medicine coming in. UNRWA, which is the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, is not able to get in the camp and is providing humanitarian assistance to those who are able, who were able to flee. Chris Gunnis, a spokesman for UNRWA, said recently, the situation in the camp is beyond inhumane. People are holed up in their houses. There's fighting going on in the streets. There are reports of bombardments. This has to stop and civilians must be evacuated. To help us understand this very difficult situation, we've called on two experts who have firsthand experience with life in the camp and what's going on at present. We're very fortunate to have Wissam Sabami and Nidal Bitari with us today. Let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Wissam Sabani was born and raised in Yarmouk camp. He holds a BA in English literature from Damascus University and has worked widely in cooperation with many NGOs in Syria to respond to the needs of the camps before the war in Syria began. In 2005, he founded and is now the director of Jeffra Foundation for Youth and Development, which focuses on the youth and development aspects of life in the camps of Palestinian refugees in Syria, in Lebanon and Turkey. Sabane is based in Beirut and goes back and forth between Yarmouk camp in Damascus and Lebanon. Our second speaker is Nidal Bitari, who was born and raised in Yarmouk camp in Syria. He earned an MA in political sociology from Damascus University. He worked as a program coordinator at the Syrian Arab Red Crescent until he left for Lebanon in 2011, where he was program coordinator at the Arab NGO Network for Development and a freelance researcher for NPR. He's also the co-founder of the Palestinian League for Human Rights in Syria. An author and researcher, Bitari has written many articles for Al Hayat, As Safir, Journal of Palestine Studies, and a number of websites. Since 2014, he has worked in Washington, D.C. as Senior Programs Manager for the organization People Demand Change. I'll ask our speakers to talk for about 15 to 20 minutes each, after which we'll open the floor for questions and discussion. Nidal Bitari will go first, and then Wissam Sabami. Those watching the live stream online can tweet questions to at Palestine Center. Please join me in welcoming our two speakers today. Thank you, Zena, for this uh, introduction, and thanks for Palestinian Center for hosting us today, and thank you for coming in this hot weather. Uh, actually, nothing left to say after your introduction about your <laughs> camp, Zena. But I would like to start, uh, since I started talking about your camp here in the U.S., I noticed that people, when you say your camp, people think that it's tents and people living out of these tents waiting the humanitarian relief assistance to, to reach them. Actually, this is not the reality. The reality is that about 500,000 uh, Palestinians, uh, Palestinian refugees left, uh, actually the, the third one, the first, second, third generations of Palestinian refugees who left uh, Palestine after Nakba in 1948 lived in uh, o overall Syria spread of, uh, over about 12 uh, camps. These camps, they were ca tents, but 
by the time uh, Palestinians could start their life again and build a very uh, amazing culture in uh, in Syria, which uh, protected uh, protected the Palestinian culture they and the Palestinian heritage. They brought it f uh, with them from Palestine, and the camps inside Syria were the cabinet of this Palestinian culture. The biggest camp of this was Al Yarmouk camp in uh, in Damascus. Uh, and, and actually we used to call it the, the capital of diaspora, Palestinian diaspora, since it hosted about uh, 160,000 Palestinians, very high educated people lived in, uh, inside Al Yarmouk camp, very high numbers and average of, uh, of, uh, uh, of people who uh, like doctors, engineers, uh, high educated people really lived in, uh, in this camp before the, the, the starting of the Syrian uh, crisis. Uh, actually, this camp was mixed of Syrians and Palestinians. I mean, before the revolution or before, about between 800,000 and 1 million inhabitants lived inside Al Yarmouk camp. Only 160,000 of them are Palestinians. Despite that, the majority was were Syrians, but the, the Palestinian culture really was inside this camp and gave the camp this this criteria of a Palestine, the Palestinianity, if we can call it, uh, that you can find all kinds of the, the headquarters of the Palestinian factions were inside this, uh, these camps. The main actors and centers and organizations of the Palestinian civil society in diaspora in Syria were inside the, this camp. Maybe the biggest was uh, Jafra Foundation. And, and, and so this camp was the leader of the, the, the Palestinian uh, activities in, uh, in Syria. Uh, and so that we saw a lot of uh, leader, uh, leaders, community leaders and youth leaders raised in the inside this <coughs> camp and lead and led uh, the camp during the crisis uh, of uh, the crisis inside Al Yarmouk camp, which started by December 2012 after the regime attacked the Syrian authorities attacked Al Yarmouk camp by uh, by May. Before that, Palestinians in uh, in Syria really tried to be neutral in this crisis for many reasons, because in our memories we have the the experiences in Jordan. Lebanon, Iraq, Kuwait, and Libya. So we did not want this experience to be repeated again inside Syria. And we knew that if this experience repeated, it will be a real catastrophe because the huge numbers of Palestinians lives, uh, lived, uh, live in, in Syria, 500,000. If, ha if, uh, if happened to them what happened in Libya and Iraq, where these people would go. And the situation is worse for Palestinians inside during this crisis for many reasons. That the Palestinians, as all maybe know, that Palestinians are under the responsibility of UNRWA. All the refugees in this world have one agency. They are under the protection of UNHCR. Only Palestinians have their own agency, which is UNRWA. And UNRWA does not have the missions that UNHCR have. Like, UNRWA is only for work and relief. So we do not have the protection from UNRWA, since UNRWA does not have protection mandate. And also, this, uh, this lead to, uh, leads to many other consequences, like if you go as Palestinian refugee, if you, are, if you could flee from Syria now, to either of Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey, which is impossible, by the way, you cannot get protection from UNRWA. And also, you cannot be under the programs of the other, like other refugees in this world, like resettlement or, or whatever. So uh, during this crisis, I know that 
what is going on with Syria, uh, with Palestinians in Syria, is part of what is going on with all Syrians. But it became worse since Syrians are Palestinians in Syria are living under three sieges, actually. Not only the siege of Yarmouk. The siege of Yarmouk, the, the regime surrounded the camp, and also from the southern area, the other uh, uh, oppositional armed groups also sieged the camp. So the people inside the camp came stuck between these two, two borders from the north and from the south between two sides, that si the, the regime side and the oppositional side. But also, if these uh, Palestinians could flee from the Al-Yarmouk camp, they cannot go out of Syria, since Lebanon blocked the borders in their faces, and they are refusing to, re to, to receive any more uh, Palestinians from Syria. Jordan, from the beginning of uh, the crisis in Syria, were very clear that we will not uh, accept to receive any more Palestinians in Jordan. And this is a decision from the, Sy the Jordanian government that we will not receive this. In uh, Turkey, Turkey, who that which is hosting now more than seven or 800,000 of Syrian refugees, and maybe more, and there are four or five camps for Syrian refugees in Turkey, they are refusing now to receive Palestinians as refugees from Syria, but they ask for a visa. And where we get this vi visa from? They, they don't have any embassy anymore in, inside Syria, and we cannot go to Lebanon or Jordan or anywhere to get this visa. So this is the second siege Palestinians are living. The third one, even if you could if flee from Lebanon, Turkey, through some like visa, you are a subject to be detained or stopped in many uh, airports around the world. We have tens of Palestinians now stuck and detained in, uh, in Malaysia, for example, in Egypt. Oh, th th this, this story in Egypt is, is horrible. For more than a year, Palestinians, families, kids, women have been det detained by the, the Egyptian uh, authorities in Karmuz uh, uh, prison in Alexandria until uh, recently the Germans decided to put an end for this uh, catastrophe and, and uh, receive these Palestinians uh, who fled from Syria to Egypt and to get them uh, uh, into their country as, uh, as refugees. These three sieges pushed people to, free, if to flee through Mediterranean. More than 227,000 persons fled from Syria through uh, Mediterranean and arrived to Europe. And it's good issue to think that Europe is treating them according to the humanitarian law, and they are receiving them and, ho and treating them as refugees. It's Actually, the, 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 the laws, the humanitarian laws in Europe and facilitated receiving uh, Palestinian refugees from, uh, from Syria. Not, they did not enter there, by the way, they did not enter their, their countries by, like, legally. They, they entered illegal to, to illegally to this, uh, to this country, but they could achieve a humanitarian uh, 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 asylum in, in this country in these countries, mainly in, uh, in Sweden. Like, I, I sometimes use this example that Yarmouk camp was completely transferred from Damascus to, to Sweden in Malmo. A lot of Palestinians could, could flee to, to, Sweden and to Sweden, and now they are enjoying the, the, the asylum there. This is the, the, the context of, uh, of, uh, of the Palestinian crisis in addition to the lack of, uh, of, uh, of support. UNRWA works under the, the principle, the safe passage. So they cannot reach Palestinians in Yarmouk or in other, in other camps 
because these camps now, like they are more camps under ISIS control, uh, control or and Jabhat al Nusra, so they cannot legally work in, in this in this area, in these areas. And the civil society, the Palestinian civil society, is since the starting of the Syrian uh, crisis is literally carrying the responsibility of uh, of uh, relieving Palestinians inside the camps. And not only in this issue, also all the work we work like the advocacy issue for Palestinian refugees in Syria, and all this is coming from this, the Palestinian civil society, which is actually the Palestinian civil society is very strong since the beginning, since like it was well established because of the Palestinian experience since uh, since Nakba and the, the faces that Palestinians. Uh, went through since uh, Nakba, uh, since Nakba until uh, until uh, the, uh, until now. Now, the current situation. Maybe we Sam can explain more about about the current situation. But it's a real difficult and and sensitive uh, situation Palestinians in in Syria are are uh, passing through. If Palestinians in Syria. Uh, I mean, if the international community in general and all the sides in Syria kept treating Palestinians or keep it treating Palestinians in Syria like this, they will put an end for the Palestinian rights. For me, like a Palestinian was born and raised in Syria, I don't have the, Palesti the, the Syrian nationality. I am in Syria since I was born until I left Syria in 2013. I am a Palestinian refugee, but I was in Syria. I had some, I enjoyed some uh, social and economic uh, rights, like the right to, uh, to, to, uh, to educate and the right to work and then etc. But once I went out of Syria, I literally felt like I am stateless. And this is not the reality. I am not stateless. I have, I am from this, I'm from Palestine, which is occupied, but none of the countries around the world, uh, uh, the world uh, treat me as a Palestinian. And they cannot uh, treat me as a Syrian. So imagine that 500,000 Palestinians left Syria to be stateless. It's a real catastrophe. And and we are now, our, all our work, in addition to, uh, to work on relief and assistance and trying to get funds from here and there and support from INGOs, from Palestinians around the world, from whatever we could, we are trying to explain to the world that there should be a solution for Palestinians in Syria. And it's a good time and very critical time that the world should do something. These Palestinians are, have the right to retain the, 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 the UN Resolution 194. If you do not want to implement this resolution one now, so when you are going to, to, to implement it, after killing all Palestinians in Syria, Palestinians in Syria are really targeted <coughs> in many ways. And we feel this, that we are targeted because we are Palestinians. We feel sometimes that there is some Israeli fingers inside the camp. I don't know if, if it's like the, the conspiracy uh, sense or something, but we feel it. We feel that we are being targeted since this, uh, the Syrian uh, 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 crisis started. 12 camps inside Syria, many, majority of them are completely destroyed from the south of Syria to the north. There is only maybe two or three camps functioning now, but Yarmouk camp is done. Homs camp is done. The, in the north, in the north now in Aleppo, there, in Aleppo there is two camps for Palestinians. One of them literally, there is no single Palestinian live in this camp anymore. All of them fled to Turkey. And until now, we don't know why both sides, the regime and, uh, and uh, the, the opposition, are targeting this camp. 
you feel that they want to erase, to remove this camp at all, geographically, I mean. So if, if we don't have, I, I mean, all Palestinians are the re Palestinian refugees around the world. They have two main proofs for their case as refugees. The camps is one of them. The camp, it's not only the place where people, Palestinian, live. No, but it was the cabinet of the Palestinian culture, culture and where Palestinians kept and, uh, and, uh, and uh, succeeded to, uh, to, to, uh, to some point that, to some extent, to, to protect their rights as Palestinian refugees as a main, uh, uh, a main protector for the Palestinian case in general. And the second one is UNRWA. UNRWA is our international uh, proof that we are exist. So if there is no camps anymore, and UNRWA is the, the international community is cutting off the, the funds for UNRWA, so we will be literally stateless without any proof for our situation and our historical rights as Palestinian refugees were kicked out of their country to be stateless around the world. Thank you so much. I'll, uh, I'll uh, leave Wissam to talk about the things. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think Nadal will make it more, uh, more easy for me to go more in details because in general, Nadal spoke about the political and the historical situation of the Palestinians in, in Syria. Uh, just uh, to explain more that uh, the targeting of the Palestinians in Syria is not happening only in one camp or in one area. Uh, in general, we, we know that Syria is living most one of the most uh, horrible civil and uh, war and conflict, I think, in the current times in the world. The main, the main issue is that even Syrian people are having the the most uh, horrible and uh, uh, unjust situation in, in the world. Part of it, as Palestinians in Syria, we are suffering the same suffering that the Syrian people are suffering in general. What make it more, uh, more difficult for us and more worse, that as a Palestinian refugee in Syria, you don't have the status of a Syrian citizen. So you have the status of a Palestinian refugee's status in Syria. That means you don't have a passport, you don't have a nationality, you have a travel document that says that you are a Palestinian refugee. Mainly this was done in agreement with the Arab countries and with the international community, mainly to keep the identity of the Palestinian and the identity of the Palestinian cause in the area. Because mainly the Palestinian conflict is a May represented by the, the issue of Palestinian refugees. The main problem and the main conflict we have with the Israelians and the main uh, issue that cannot be solved easily is the Palestinian refugees. The main reason why the Palestinian modern revolution began was just we are Palestinian refugees and we want to go back to our homeland. For this most of the Arabic countries and the international community agreed to keep the status of the Palestinian refugees in the surrounding uh, neighborhood countries of Palestine and Israel on the status of Palestinian refugees. Unfortunately, this was used as a point against the Palestinian people. For example, in Lebanon, to be a Palestinian refugee in Lebanon, that means you, cannot, you don't have the right to work, you don't have the right to, uh, to be uh, employed in the government. You don't have the right even to reconstruct your areas with which is the Palestinian camp. You don't have the right even to work and to develop the infrastructure and the situation in your camps. And this also happened now in Syria. The same, the same story uh, is happening now in Syria. As a Palestinian refugee from Syria, for example, you cannot enter Lebanon while in the same time any Syrian can enter Lebanon or in Turkey or in Egypt or any other, most of the other Arab countries. As Palestinian refugee, you are not allowed. The main, uh, the main idea they are telling, we want you to, to stay in your areas 
in this country near Palestine, so we keep your fight and we keep the, the, the Palestinian identity and we keep the Palestinian, uh, uh, you know, uh, cause. Unfortunately, uh, this propaganda is used by most of the Arabic countries and some of the Turkish, even the Turkish government. So for example, we speak with the Turkish president, why you don't accept any Palestinian from Syria to come to Turkey? They tell we, because you are Palestinian refugees and we want you to stay near Palestine and to keep your cause. Exactly, exactly. Targeting of the Palestinian in Syria is very, is very clear. And it began from the beginning of the Syrian conflict. Began the story of one camp called uh, Dar'a camp. Dar'a camp is in, uh, in, in Dar'a city, South Syria. Have contained like around 20,000 Palestinian. Was targeted since the beginning of the Syrian revolution and the Syrian conflict. This was also somehow represented by the foreign ministry of Syria when Busayna Shaban told there is some Palestinian terrorist who is making this uh, uh, conflict in Dar'a and they are participating in destroying our country. This was in 2011, something like in the beginning of the Syrian revolution. This also was represented another time in Latakia, which is the coast city, in a Rommel camp, when also the Palestinian camp in this city was targeted in this city. It moved again to Damascus, uh, and we speak about many different camps. We speak about Hussainiya camp, Sbene camp, Khan Sheikh camp, and Yarmouk camp. This is four camps that were also contained most of the Palestinian number population who live around Damascus, which was the capital of, the, of Syria, but also we consider it as the capital of the Palestinian refugees. I, I speak with you now, for example, that Sbene camp, Hassaniya camp, and Sid Zainab camp was totally destroyed. That means 100% destroyed. Sbene camp, Hussainiya camp now have no Palestinian inside and nobody inside. They are evacuated totally. Then we go back to the story of Yarmouk camp, which we are from, and is very known because of the story. Yarmouk camp, as Nidal told, was containing around, I think, around 200,000 Palestinian and another 400,000 Syrian. It was a very big city, a very big uh, cultural capital, for even for the Syrian. Uh, it was a very important uh, civil movement was very important and the capital for Palestinian organization and Palestinian parties and everybody there was working their most because it was a symbol of the Palestinian refugee in all the area. Whoever is big there, who, whoever is controlling all the Palestinian refugee, this was the importance of Yarmouk camp. Yarmouk camp is the only place in the Middle East where people died of hunger. We have documented 160 person who died because of malnutrition, because of lack of health care. And I speak not health care about hospitals, but I speak about simple medicine. I speak about uh, diabetic medicine, about the pressure medicine. In Yarmouka is the only place where the kilo of rice arrived to around $200. For a place besieged more than two and a half years, with around, it was around 30,000 civilians, more than two and a half years, nobody working, under conflict, under targeting, under recruitment of children, and recruitment of young people, and recruitment of, of uh, poor people, where 170 persons, most of them children and old people, died because of malnutrition, literally malnutrition, children milk. Children milk was not allowed to enter to this camp. Bread. I know children in Yarmouk camp, they are now three years old. Since one month is the first time they see the bread. I know children now in Yarmouk camp, after three years, they never saw a banana. They never saw a chicken. They don't know it. They don't know it. I saw a child one month ago. I gave him one banana. He told, what is this? I don't know what is this. 
this is the situation in Yarmouk. And this is the only area, by the way, in Syria, who has this severe situ humanitarian and military situation. There is a lot of areas in Syria who is besieged, who is uh, in conflict, who is in military conflict, but according to our knowledge and according, it never happened in one area to this severe uh, situation. There is no medicine that we, on our team and in other like voluntary teams that is in your mood, if you get a bullet in your hand, the only thing we can do to save you is to cut your hand. This is the situation. We are cutting hands and legs and of everybody. This is the only way we can do to help the people because there is no medicine. The hospital was targeted, uh, bombed and shelled. There is no electricity in your mood camp since two years and a half. The children there doesn't know electricity. One time we took some children outside of the camp with their mission and this, and they saw the lights and they saw the situation. They said, what is this? This is another city. And this city is 100 meters far from your camp. They saw the electricity, they saw the sweet, they saw the bread, they saw the vegetables, the fruits. They thought this is paradise. Literally. Yarmouk camp is since one year without water. Water. Drinking water or running water. We had to dig wells to track the water to the homes and to some distribution point. Every child and every family has to go in the morning a trip of one hour or two hours to fill a 20 liter of water and come back to his home to feed, to, to give to his uh, family and to, give and to, to his. The gender of being sniped. Sniped, uh, recruited, uh, anything. This is the situation in Yarmouk camp and in other camps. So we don't need to speak about education. Education stopped. Uh, UNRWA retreated from these camps. So no education, uh, no facility, no health facilities, no hospital, nothing. Literally nothing. Nobody is working there. The main job we have for the Palestinians in Syria is recruitment. Recruitment for different militia. Children, uh, old people, anybody who want to have a work or to do anything, there is only one way for you, is to do, to join a militia, or to join anybody fighting and gain your salary. What is the average salary? $20. $20 per month. To get alive is $20 now in your camp. So you can imagine if you have $1,000, you can have a 50 militia fighting with you. This is how much sheep life in, in your camp and in other areas in, in Syria. And this is because the people lose hope, have nothing to, to do and have nothing, uh, no other solution to survive. <laughs> Waste management, for example. There is nobody uh, taking care about the infrastructure in, in Yarmouk camp, in Khan Sheikh camp, and in other camps. So the garbage and the waste is full in the streets. This created many uh, diseases in the, in, the, in the streets. Now, mainly who do this is civil organizations, civil groups, local groups who try to take care about this. But no government and no UNRWA and no international NGOs is trying to take care about this or to manage this. Pollution of water in Yarmouk camp, in Khan Sheikh camp, we did a water test. The water is not drinkable. The people are drinking uh, water that cannot feed them because it is mixed with the infrastructure of the sewage system of the, of the country. Uh, most of the children now in Yarmouk camp and in these areas have scabies, lices, skin diseases, uh, uh, diseases in the stomach and uh, in the kidneys because of the water situation. This is in general uh, the situation, uh, speaking about the humanitarian situation inside the camps within the free areas or in the conflict areas. Then you got back to speak about the IDDs, the people who evacuated these camps, civilians, and went to other Palestinian camps seeking a safe place. So most of them are now in Damascus, in 
as our camps like Jaromana camp and Andamin camp. And this camps already was in a very bad situation without infrastructure that carry already the population that had. For example, Jaromana camp is 20,000 civilians. Another 40,000 IDPs came to this camp. So you can imagine the situation. We know that in every apartment, we have in every room there's two families living. The IDBs also use the Onorwa schools to take shelter. And that means in every class there is two or three families staying together in this Onorwa school. That means also there was a problem in the education because Onorwa schools was used as shelters. There is no education anymore for, for these people. These people also lost their job also because of the financial uh, embargo on Syria, the inflation of the Syrian bond become very much, the, the economical situation and the, of the civilians in Syria in general is very difficult. The average of the salary now is around $50 for a, for a family, even if you are working for a government or for uh, a private business, you receive $50 per month and you have to live with it. And you can imagine how much uh, the situation is, is difficult regarding this. Most of the people were depending on the Norwa uh, assistance, cash assistance, food basket distribution and all this. Now Norwa have seized most of their relief uh, actions in, in Syria. So the people begin also to have more bad situation. They cannot leave the country because of the closure of all the borders around them. The only solution for for the people now as prostitution, uh, child laborhood, militia recruitment, and the unemployment. And the people have to choose between all of this. I tell you an information, 50% uh, of the militia, unofficial militia fighting in Syria with the regime or against the regime are Palestinians. In the Nerab camp, it's a, a camp in North Syria, in Aleppo. There is a brigade called Jerusalem Brigade. You could uh, also, it's the same name. It's a Palestinian uh, pro-government militia. It has 3,000 young fighters fighting with the regime. When you speak about IS and Nusra in South Damascus or in North or in this, I know personally that in, in South Damascus, 60% of the militia who is fighting is Palestinian. That means they are not Palestinian uh, for the Palestinian, but they are recruited by different parties. Why? Because they have very bad situation. They can accept a little salary, and nobody will represent them and, or speak about them. 16, 14 years old, go to a military training for one month and then join the militia for a $20 to $50 per month. In general, this is the situation. I think as much as I, I speak, I will not be able to, to tell everything because the reality is much, much more uh, difficult and much, much more horrible than whatever I can say in, in my words or what I can show you in photos or videos. Uh, the all I can say is that what is happening there is inhuman, in unfair, and injustice injustice even for the international community who was part of this problem, who caused and helped in causing this problem and causing the Palestinian refugee issue, disregard of the Syrian conflict and their interest on side it. Uh, also injustice and inhuman and shameful for the international community, for the UN community, and for the Arabic countries and even for the Palestinians in Palestine and in the other countries. It was unclear for, for, for us and for everybody that because it's happening in Syria, because it is very sensitive, because it is a pro-regime or against regime, because it is with revolution or against revolution, until now we couldn't even get a full solidarity from the Palestinians themselves. Until now we couldn't get a position, a political position from the Palestinian authorities themselves or from the Palestinian parties, or from the Palestinian diaspora community, and besides the international and the time. And thank you.
think we leave for the question. Thank you very much, Nidal and uh, Wissam, for this very sobering um, uh, description of what's going on in the camp. Uh, before I open this up for uh, questions and discussion, I wondered, Wissam, whether you could talk a little bit about Jafra Foundation and uh, and if and what you're doing there and what you what you can do, what you're able to do there. So, because of this situation and because of more humanitarian situation crisis in in Syria. Many local groups, Syrian and Palestinian local groups, begin to, to evolve and to, to try to respond to this situation, mainly because of the lack of services that is, was happening because of the international NGO couldn't enter to these areas. As we speak about areas of very sensitive conflict and very insecure for criteria of UNORWA or UN to enter to these areas or to international NGOs to go physically and work there. A lot of uh, local groups, uh, especially in the Palestinian camps, begin to try to do and to, to, to develop a movement that could react and could help the people, their people themselves, by themselves. One of them was uh, Jafra, Jafra Foundation. Jafra Foundation was built even before the conflict in Syria, mainly was targeting to build capacity of young people and empower the young people. This young people, most of them now, uh, have died because of the conflict. Most of them was activists in the Syrian conflict. Most of them was a humanitarian workers. Uh, I remember like uh, uh, Khaled Bakrawi, who was uh, also a manager in, in our foundation, who was uh, uh, arrested and killed in the Syrian regime prison because of his relief activities. And many, many others, many, many others. I cannot speak all, all their names because they are a lot. Uh, Jafra Foundation decided to work in the two areas. And that means in the regime control area, officially, and in the opposition and the free Syria control area, also officially. And we are one of the rare organizations in Syria who can work officially and visibly in the two areas. Because you know of the sensitive situation, the Syrian regime tell us why you work in your MOOC camp, it is under opposition control, and you help, for example, the opposition and this, and we told, and also in the opposition area, why you work in the regime control area, you are giving legitimacy to the regime, and you are helping the regime. Our main idea is we will work wherever there is Palestinian need. and. Anybody who will tell us stop to work here because you cannot work here and there, we will stop to work in his place. Until now, we were able to uh, to work in the two areas. Uh, we try to do what what the others couldn't do. For example, in Yarmouk camp, we do the waste management since two years and a half. We do the water trucking in Yarmouk and in Khan Sheikh camp. We do uh, also the school for the children who was out of schools in the opposition areas and in the IDB shelters areas. Uh, we have around 13,000 child who take education and the psycho support, social uh, support uh, in the Palestinian camps. Uh, we have a relief program who work to distribute food baskets and hygiene kits and other uh, needs like medical needs for around every month around three to 4,000 families who is in the most in the most need. Some of them are in Yarmouk camp in the besieged area. Some others are in Khan Sheikh, which is a very tension area and nobody can reach. We work in five different locations, uh, Yarmouk camp, Yalda, Babila, Sahem, and Jaramana camp, and Qutsaya, which is a lot of IDBs from Yarmouk camp have joined in the, it's in, uh, in opposition control area, but it's uh, an area where there is a truce. That means there is agreement of peace between the opposition and the regime. There is a lot of IDBs. And in Khan Sheikh area. In our work, uh, we until now we lost five uh, volunteers. The last one we lost three days ago in Khan Sheikh camp with the barrel shilling. We lost one volunteer and uh, uh, our center was also shelled which caused also a 15 child was wounded and one woman was, was killed. 
and one volunteer of the water trucking was, was killed. Before this, in April, uh, 2nd of April, when ISIS entered the Hormuk camp, they also killed one of our volunteers, shot, shot him in, in the conflict. Before this, we lost also two volunteers in the prison. They were killed in, in the Syrian prison. And until now, we have three volunteers who is, one of them is kidnapped and two of them are in the prison. Since one year or, and uh, yes. Mainly what we do is to, to cover the need of the people where nobody can, can cover. In the areas where it is a little bit conflict areas where Norway cannot enter or uh, where also they need a lot of permissions to enter food or this, we manage everything for others and then we try to help them to distribute and to take care of the, of the people. This in general about our foundation. It, our foundation is a Palestinian uh, refugee idea to speak and to represent the Palestinian people in Syria. In general, not only for relief, now we try to develop it to be part of it, also advocacy for the Palestinians in Syria. One of them is our visits here, but also we went to Geneva, we went to Human Rights Council, we went to many different countries and many different meetings, and we try to always meet with all the international for foreign ministries or uh, anybody who is interested to hear about the Palestinian in Syria or to see if he can help about the Palestinian in Syria. I'll open the floor for discussion and questions. Uh, thank you, Nidal and Wissam, for this, uh, I don't want to say fruitful, it's very informative information, uh, detailed information that we hear about these things just really in brief in media, but it's, it's really amazing how much we don't know about what's going on there. Uh, with Sam, um, my question to you, since you talked about Jeffra, and um, do you reach there? You said you're entering the camp, you're going there. So you go, you fly from here to, to, to Syria, and you go into the camp. Uh, how, how this uh, feasible, I mean, how possible to do that? The other thing is, uh, there. was that? <laughs> he's, he's, based, there. he's based in Lebanon. You are based there. You're just visiting. Yeah. All right, I see. So what, what else, uh, I mean, what kind of things that usually, uh, what kind of relief things for relief you bring there? I mean, how people here can help and um, like send something or whatever can contribute and do something in this regard? Uh, <coughs> in general, we, we work in everything. That means we work in food distribution, schools for children, uh, relief actions like medical help and, uh, and uh, food baskets, hygiene kits, uh, all this. How people here can help, I think there is many different ways. One of them is through the, for example, I mean, we are here and Jerusalem Fund also can already uh, express interest to help us. So if you want to help us, could be a good channel through Jerusalem Fund to, to, to help us, I mean physically. What we need more here is advocacy. What we need more here and seriously is the governments, the international community, the UN, to know about what is happening for the Palestinian and to encourage them to carry responsibility. This is uh, a really big need for us because we know that nobody knows what is happening in the Palestinian camp in Syria. And we try more and more to push the people and to do advocacy to, to raise the voice of, of the situation. Speaking about financial help or donation or this, I think the best way is through foundations such as like Jerusalem or any other foundation who can. Um, over here, and then we'll go to all of you. Thank you. I, I see the situation in Yarmouk similar to 1948 Nakba, that these people are leaving and probably will never return back. 
But I want to know, uh, why does the UN um, HCR not cover the Palestinians? And within the, the, um, the PLO, the whole refugee issue, aren't the Syrian Palestinians a priority? Uh, you remind me that when I talked to my friends who left the camp in s December 2012, they said to us that literally that the picture in our minds we had from our grandmothers and fathers who left Palestine is the same. What happened in Yarmouk camp? People carrying their stuff and running out of the camp uh, away from the, the shilling and, uh, and the clashes. Why Palestinians are not, uh, actually it was because of a decision from a UN decision after uh, 1948. They decided to, uh, because of, there was a political, uh, for a political reason, they, uh, they established the UNRWA for Palestinians. A and I believe that maybe there was not yet uh, UNHCR because mm -hmm. UNHCR was established later in uh, in fifties after uh, maybe after because of after maybe in nineteen fifty four I, I believe so the UNRWA is before the UNHCR I think so. In either way, there is a political reason behind keeping Palestinians under UNRWA and keeping UNRWA shortage of two mandates. The mission, they demanded to, they, uh, their two, two mandates, they, the protection and resettlement. Because Palestinian refugees in Syria and Lebanon and uh, in Jordan are political card, these governments can play and, and use it for whatever reason. Like for example, in Syria, you know the resistance uh, supporters and and etc. Actually, I, I want to use what <coughs> the Ambassador Samantha Power used in her uh, in her speech in the Security Council about Yarmouk camp when, si when she said that whenever the, the Syrian regime said that Palestinians are our priority and uh, we are supporting their rights and we are supporting the resistance, we have to remind the Syrian regime that there are Palestinians inside Yarmouk camp and the regime is sieging that. Uh, what was the other part of the PLO. question? P PLO, okay, and PLO actually, since what I know, what I witnessed, actually what I participated to, uh, and that when I was in Lebanon in 2012, there was a very huge interest in from the PLO in, in Lebanon to, to know and to, to help in, inside Syria. But historically, there uh, there is, a huge problems and problematic uh, pending problematic uh, points and issues between the PLO and the Syrian regime. So they could not intervene uh, from the beginning and they carry the responsible and to carry the responsibility of Palestinians in, uh, in Syria. And also uh, they tried to send many missions and actually they sent Many missions from Ramallah to uh, to uh, to Al Yarmouk camp to start negotiating about to, to Damascus. I mean to start negotiating with the Syrian regime uh, about Yarmouk camp and the other camps and the whole Palestinian existence in Syria. The the PLO had to go through negotiation negotiations to solve the problems between them and the Syrian regime, like. Between mainly between Fatah organization and uh, and, the, and the Syrian regime, it took more than a year of missions going back and forth between Ramallah and, and Damascus to solve this uh, these problems. But on the other hand, what I noticed through my meetings with PLO figures, either here or or in uh, other countries in Lebanon and around the world, that they are not really, Palestinians in Syria is not their priority because they have like their problems with the Israelis and you know the occupied areas and negotiations and the stop of negotiations and, and, and et cetera. And also through like 
20, more than 20 years of bad relations between PLO and the Syrian regime. PLO lost all their uh, access to Palestinian camps inside Syria. They don't have uh, followers as it was, it, it used to be before, uh, before before 1984, you know, uh, before during the Lebanese war. So since 1982, 1983, until uh, 2012, this uh, relation between them and, and the regime was completely bad sometimes and sometimes completely catastrophic. So they didn't have this access to, to, to the camps to, to support and to help. Sometimes they used to send uh, two million dollars monthly from Ramallah to uh, to the Palestinian embassy in Lebanon to be distributed as cash money assistance and uh, and relief assistance to uh, Palestinians inside Syria and Syrian Palestinians who are in Lebanon, which has actually it was and it's very uh, like lack uh, little money that does not cover the huge needs of Palestinians. Thank you, Nidal. Um, other questions? Yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you both for coming to speak today. Um, I have two questions. The first one uh, is how many um, Pal Palestinian refugees in Syria uh, are there now? Like, it's a really difficult number to come around. I'm curious to hear your take on it. And how fast are they leaving? Like, what's the... Um, you know, how many are going to Turkey and whatever. Uh, my other question is for you, Assam. You, told, you talked about how many Palestinian refugees in Syria are joining, um, like, rebellion movements because of abject poverty and poor situations. I'm curious if there's other sort of mo motivations behind that. Like, obviously, uh, a lot of the Palestinians in Syria have, for a long time, had beefs with the Syrian regime, and if there's, like, more political motivations behind that. Thank you. Regarding Palestinians who, who left Syria, according to, to UNRWA numbers, there is about 50,000 Palestinians left to Lebanon. I believe that the number is more than this. Uh, some, some numbers, when you go through the civil society organizations, either Palestinians or Lebanese, you, the number is uh, more than 70,000. Uh, in Jordan, since uh, Jordanians refuse to, to, to receive any, uh, any Palestinians, uh, the numbers is very little, mainly people who used to live in the south of Syria, uh, maybe four to five thousands. Some numbers say that they are about eight, eight thousand. Uh, in Egypt, uh, even in Egypt when Morsi was in, in control, he opened the borders and the airports for Palestinians, and I believe there was about 2,800 2, Palestinians could fly to, to Egypt, but when uh, CC came, he canceled and start putting people in, the, in jail, literally. In, uh, in Turkey, it's hard to tell, but uh, for sure, according to uh, uh, civil society organizations and my trip to Turkey in uh, last November, uh, hundreds of, of uh, Palestinians are uh, are in Turkey. P uh, according to my, uh, I expect like the maximum in, in Turkey is maybe 2,000 to 3,000 these people who fled from uh, Nairobi and Aleppo uh, in Aleppo in the north to, uh, to, to Turkey. It's, it's very hard to tell how many Palestinians. In general, out of 600,000 Palestinians used to live in Syria, there is still until, until now between 400 and 450,000 are still inside Syria, in Damascus, in the coastal areas in, in Syria, and uh, somehow uh, some little in, in the south and little in the north, but until now, the maybe huge numbers uh, are still inside Damascus. As Wissam mentioned, they left to safe areas. 
and uh, that's it I, I believe huh? just to to add for uh, for Nidal, most of the people who travel to Turkey or to Egypt or anywhere near near Syria their their target is to to arrive to Europe and mainly through the boats of uh, they call it the boats of death hundreds of people have uh, died on, on this way from Turkey or Egypt or uh, Libya to 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 Europe a lot of them are our friends and our uh, part of our family. That means uh, it's not like we speak uh, about something that we heard about. I know a lot of friends who died in the sea or who crossed from Turkey or Egypt or uh, Libya uh, to try to, to, to reach Europe. They died on the, on the sea. 7,200. A, re a report was, uh, was published, I think, yesterday or before yesterday, that 36,000 Palestinians from Syria arrived to Europe since the beginning of the crisis and the conflict of Syria. Most of them, they arrived by the boats. Uh, this is another story. The boats means you have to pay around $6,000 to, to, to pay for the boat. And to take, that means you have to sell your home or whatever you have. All the family have to sell everything to collect this money. And you pay it to die on the sea. 50 percent you, you will die in the sea, 50 percent you will arrive. This is that, that trip. Now, I know a lot of friends who cross through. They take a visa to Sudan. From Sudan, they cross the desert to Libya. In Libya, they take the boat. In Libya, they have the the risk in the, in the desert to die because they are crossing the desert. I know a friend who died in this desert. <coughs> the other risk is to deal with the militia who take your money, who take your phone, who take everything. The other risk is to be killed in, the, in, the, in this desert. Then you arrive to another mafia who take care about you from Libya short to Italy and you have a big risk to die there also by this mafia if you don't die by the sea. And the same, the same story in Turkey and in Egypt before. This is the, the way to arrive. And this is why there is a lot of recruitment, my friends. The people are fed up. The people need protection. The people need money to, to, to live. They want to feed their family. In Syria, you have two choices now with most vulnerable people. In Syria, they have to, two choices, prostitution or recruitment. or to escape. If you don't have this $5,000, that means you are most vulnerable people, you stay in the country, and you take other choices. You try to leave, but recruitment mainly is happening for ideology or for political, no. After you're, you are recruited, you go on a program, according to the militia who recruited you, you go on a program to have ideology or whatever. And you speak, I speak about everybody in Syria. I don't speak about opposition or regime. There is money fighting militia with the regime and money militia against the regime, money extremist, money non-extremist. Everybody is recruiting people in Syria. And who you recruit? The most vulnerable people who have no other choice and need a little money or need a protection or need whatever. The only solution we could fight this recruitment is to encourage and to strengthen the civil society organizations inside to be a case or a movement of another place, another choice. So as a volunteer, you come to us, you belong to our family. And our family, we give you the $20 also as a volunteer, Berdim or whatever. But also, we protect you because we are a big family. We are a civil family that can protect you. This is the only solution we could do until now. But the recruitment is a high percentage. Children recruitment is very high because very easy and very cheap and nobody care about it. Okay, do we have any more questions for our guests today? Okay, that will be the last question. Um, what about the Hold on, can you wait till the... Yeah. What about the Palestinian communities that are not in the camps? Like, 30 years ago, I spent a lot of time, I think it's in Dumar or Guma, it's kind of in the north area, a lot of Palestinian families there. How are they faring? Now they are on IDB shelter for the Palestinians who fled from the camps. 
So in Dum in Duma, Dumar and in this area, Jaramana camp also, for example, or other camps or other gatherings. We call them gatherings because it's not an official camp. As you know, most of them, they had relatives, for example, from other camps. So these relatives, when they took IDB, they went to their, to, to these gatherings or community. So they became a host community for the other Palestinian refugees, relatives, sisters, brothers, uncles, cousins, and they share what they have with them. And this is another problem because we spoke about now, for example, in one apartment, you find four to five families. In the same room, you have two families sometimes living together. Also, they share the schools, the education, the, uh, the infrastructure. In a camp like, uh, in an area like Jaramana camp, with, it was 20,000 Palestinian, now there's 60,000 Palestinian. 60,000 Palestinian with the same infrastructure, with the same school, and with the same space. Already was crowded, and now it's more crowded. And this goes also to the Palestinian camps in Lebanon. Ain al Hilwe camp, Nahr al Barid camp, Baddawi camp, they were already crowded and in very bad humanitarian situation, and now they received around 60,000 Palestinians from Syria. So you can imagine how much the infrastructure, the surfaces, and the, uh, the sensitivity of clashes and extremism in these communities is happening. Al Hilwe yesterday, to, there, before yesterday, there was a conflict in Lebanon. Three, be, three young people was died because two militia fighted with each other. So also it's increasing the, the violence and the harsh circumstances and the education system and the relief and system. And the kids who are still in foster. Yes. Okay, well, I really want to thank uh, Wissam Sabani and Nizal Bittari for this very articulate and candid um, description of what's going on now and anal analysis of the situation. Thank you for all the work you do. Thank you for sharing your time with us. I think you've accomplished definitely the goal, one goal, of um, enlightening us and educating us. And I hope uh, many of us will go on and educate and enlighten others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.